Well, welcome to this video and uh, delighted to welcome back Professor Robert Clancy, who needs no introduction now on this channel at all. Robert, thank you for, for coming back. Pleasure. Now, we've looked at the, this is our sort of potted history of the, the development of immunology and how to understand it, this layered approach. We looked at the specific era where there was antigens and forming particular, stimulating the production of particular antibodies, then the cellular era, then the molecular era. And now we're into a modern era, and I believe we're going to use some interesting examples. Where would you like to start, Robert? Well, what we've done so far, we've talked about traditional immunology, the type of immunology that's taught in every medical school, every nursing school, and uh, probably every science course. Uh, and that is the immunology of systemic immunity. Uh, and there's a lot of reasons for this. It's, it's very easy to study. Uh, it's got very clear-cut uh, messages. And those of you who have been following this uh, series will remember that we talked about IgM and IgG antibodies. And we talked about those as occurring within the bloodstream, circulating in the body, and stimulated by an injected antigen or an antigen that gets into the uh, bloodstream. For example, um, a measles vaccine um, or a measles virus infecting somebody quickly gets into the bloodstream before it gets to the skin and the various target organs. And so this is a very efficient system. The whole aim is to make sure that the Inter internal part of the body is free of infection, free of foreign antigens. And so it has uh, a, a way of exploding and killing whatever comes in very quickly. And that uses an innate system based on either uh, phagocytic cells, which will eat the, the bacteria or virus, or cascading systems that explode with effect or mechanisms that will kill the bacteria. And the most important and the best known one of those is the complement system. Now, way back in uh, around about World War I, it was recognised that uh, there may be a different way of handling various infections that don't actually get into the body but operate on the surfaces of the body, particularly the mucosal surface. That is the surface, the wet surfaces that line the lung or the gut or the eye, the nose, uh, the vagina, uh, so, uh, the, the various, the bladder, the various um, systems that are exposed to the outside world uh, and have to deal with all the bacteria and all the different antigens that come their way. And a man called Bezrecka, who was from Czechoslovakia, who uh, worked in the Pasteur Institute, started killing bacteria that caused Shigella dysentery. This was a terrible problem where more people died in some of the theatres of war from Shigella dysentery than they actually did from uh, um, being killed on the battlefield. And he was able to show that by actually feeding these killed bacteria, he can actually induce a level of immunity. But no one quite understood it. You know, how could you do this when all the work that had been done in the Pasteur Institute and the Koch Institute in Berlin, all the, the great mucos uh, the immunology centres that had appeared over the last 30 or 40 years were working on this systemic immune response? Well, not much really happened other than other studies like this until uh, in the mid-1960s. Uh, a man called uh, Tom Tomasi, working in Buffalo, New York. Um, Tom found that a newly identified immunoglobulin, and remember that the IgG antibody was an immunoglobulin, that's the type of protein it was. A newly defined one, which was called IgA, was actually the, that anti the antibodies in the secretions of the body were mainly IgA antibodies. They weren't IgG, they were IgA. And that created a completely new area of discovery and work and a completely new area of immunology, which we now call mucosal immunology, because this was the immunology of the surfaces, not the systemic inside parts of the body. And it all began with identifying IgA as the marker of this system because most of the antibodies and remember that there are more antibodies actually in secretions than there are actually in blood. 
There's huge amounts, there's handfuls of IgA antibody. And the remarkable thing was that this IgA antibody wasn't like IgG. It, it didn't activate the complement system to go through enzymic steps to explosively kill bacteria. It did have a, an effect on bacteria that would clump them together so that the macrophages and the phagocytic cells could take those cells up and destroy them. It prevented virus getting through into cells. So it had an effect on it by itself, but not with the various innate immune system mechanisms that we have come to understand with respect to IgG antibody in the blood system. So, so we, we, presumably, we, Robert, first... there must be um, beta, uh, B, B, B lymphocytes living in the mucosal areas to produce these antibodies. A absolutely. And in fact, the next stage, uh, as always, John, you're one step, one step ahead of progress <laughs> here. Um, the, the factory for the B lymphocytes, because it's always B lymphocytes that make antibody, yeah. was not in the spleen and the lymph nodes, which is the factories for systemic immunity, but little tiny knobs of lymphoid tissue in the wall of the small bowel, which anyone here who is even somewhere similar to my age would remember doing anatomy and seeing these little lumps and they were called payas patches and we didn't have a clue. We had no idea what they did and it was a bit of a nuisance that we had to remember them because they seemed pretty useless. Well now, uh, in uh, 1971, uh, John Sebra, another uh, very important uh, American immunologist, uh, John and his PhD students found that the payas patches contained the factory for the IgA molecules. Uh, the B lymphocytes, that if you took the B lymphocytes from payas patches uh, in a rabbit and injected them into a rabbit, they turned up in the gut making IgA antibody. And so this was the second big step, but there needed to be a third step. And the third step came the following year, 1972, 1973. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be working uh, in the group led by uh, Professor John Bienenstock at McMaster University in Canada. Uh, my role was to kill the rabbits. I, I had a pretty small role in all of this. Um, I was a, a very junior, junior person. Um, but John came up with the idea that this system that Zebra had described of um, aggregated, if you like, lymphoid tissue in the mucosal surface of the gut, maybe it also occurred in the lung. And so he uh, came up with the idea, if we take the lymphocytes that we could take from the lining of the lung and injected them back into irradiated rabbits, then we, uh, we, we could see what happened. And what actually happened was, both in the lung and in the gut, little... Um, B lymphocytes making IgA antibody were found. And so he said, ah, there's a system that there must be a communication system between all the different mucosal surfaces of the body. And he came up with the term, the common mucosal system. And so this basically completed the triad of observations that put together this mucosal immune system. So in principle, you had an IgA, a unique new molecule, appearing in secretions called the IgA antibody. The factory for them were the little lymphoid tissue which was in the wall of the small bowel called payas patches. And there were similar little lymphoid tissues, not so dominant, in the wall of the bronchus, the, the various tubes that go to the, uh, the lung, and uh, which John Bienenstock called the bronchus-associated lymphoid tissue, or BORT. And so... Uh, within a couple of years, we then had a system. We, we didn't quite know if it did much, but we knew it existed. Uh, but that really established the, the ground rules for mucosal immunology. So to put it simply, there's pears patches in the bronchi as well. Yes. But Just we, the call something called, different. Called, <laughs> but they, they, were, they were actually morphologically and functionally the same. There's not many in humans. Um, in the rabbit, they, they, there's quite a few. And every animal system has some, but in humans, you normally only see it when there's an infection and there's a reason to have a process for, an, uh, for processing antigens in the bronchus lumen. So the, the, it's mainly, and, and we'll come to this, that the, the, the dominant flow 
of the B lymphocytes and then we, we showed later that it was also involving T lymphocytes, these cells flowed from the pus patch to the lung rather than the lung creating its own, um, it, its own protection. Nearly all of it comes from the pus patch. And what, um, what my group went on and showed was that the secretions of the lung pour into the gut. Uh, as we sit here, perfectly healthy people, we swallow a, a cupful of secretions from the, uh, from the lung every day without knowing it. It's only when you get to a couple of cupfuls of secretions that you start coughing and coughing that up, at what we call sputum or, or phlegm. Um, and that's the excess amount. So we're presenting into the gut the antigens that might be in the bronchus. If bacteria, virus, uh, if you get the COVID virus, it gets aspirated up into the gut and it goes to the pious patches. And so what developed, John, was this idea that there was an off-site development of immunity for the lung. And uh, the lung was recognised as having one big function, and that is gas exchange, critical function, oxygen in, carbon dioxide out. And it would borrow from off-site whatever immunity it needed. Uh, it would tell the off-site factories by actually swallow, by them swallowing whatever was in the lung and going down to these pious patches. And you can see, uh, as that diagram up the... Yes, put the, yes. In the diagram, you can see, it's a, a fairly schematic diagram, but you can see a blue line, which is number one. Yeah. And that represents the normal aspiration of uh, secretions into the gut. Uh, you can see the stomach. And then after the stomach, there are these little uh, uh, patches, the blue patches, uh, yep. And they're the pious patches. Uh, now, the interesting thing, you'll see that uh, what is demonstrated here is a T cell, not a B cell, that's going to the bronchus. Yes. Uh, and that, that didn't make sense. It certainly didn't make sense to us because uh, we did these studies in rats and we were able to cannulate the thoracic duct, which is where all the lymphocytes from the gut, they go into the thoracic duct, which then goes into the blood stream. And we just assumed these would be B lymphocytes making antibody. Uh, but in fact, it turned out that the most protective cells for infection were the T lymphocytes. Now, this was quite unprecedented. It didn't make sense. And it was only 15, 20 years later that people discovered a new type of T cell called the TH17 cell, uh, which was, we've talked about uh, T4 cells and T8 cells in the systemic immune response. Uh, the T4 cell being the helper, CD4 T cell being the helper cell, the CD8 T cell being the killer cells. Well, here we have a CD4 cell, which is actually, they're actually CD4 cells. I should, I should have made that clear. Yep. But they're TH17 because of the particular role and function that they have. Uh, and uh, when we heard about this being discovered, we went back and looked and found that exactly they were exactly the cells that we'd found uh, back in the mid-1990s uh, uh, that was transferring the immunity uh, from the gut to the lung. So we, we then had a system uh, that created immunity off-site, presenting it as it was needed to the airways to protect it against infection. So these TH17 cells, are, it's a subcategory of the CD4, the, 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 uh, the helper lymphocytes. Correct. They go, they, they go from the pet pair, that, so they're sensitized to the specific antigen in the gut because we've swallowed it from the lung. Yes, yes. These cells then migrate into the lymphoid-associated tissue of the lung. Exactly. Into the mucosal surface. Yeah. Into the, the lining mucosa of the lung. Right, right, right. And then the, these helper cells must stimulate uh, B cells that are already there, presumably, to produce well, the immunoglobulin well, type A's. It's interesting. What we found was that the, the dominant protection mechanism, uh, sure, there's also B cells making a little bit IgA antibody uh, and various other things, but the dominant protective mechanism was recruiting and activating neutrophils. Now, I think you once called neutrophils microphages or... Yeah, mi microphages like opposed to... Micro yeah, macrophages. and that's a good, it's a good term. They're the, yeah. the little gobbler opposite. They're, the, they're the, the, the garbage disposal cells. Yeah. But 
what was happening, and this, this was, again, we didn't appreciate the significance of this when we first observed it, was that these TH17 cells bring in from the bloodstream uh, an innate system which is dominated by cells which are called, they're part of the white cells of the blood. They're the, the poly, you can see there's some there listed number five, you can see, and you can see the little dots of the nucleus. Yeah. Um, they can also be the dots of gobbling up bacteria, I suppose. But yeah. the, the nucleus of the neutrophil uh, is segmented. So you have, uh, it's like a little roll of sausages. Yeah. Um, and, and it's quite easy. It, it's found in every pathology laboratory when you have a blood count. They count the number of neutrophils that you have, uh, the number of lymphos, the, the different types of white cells. Yeah. But the interesting thing here was, and um, again, we didn't uh, we, we we noted it, but we didn't realise how significant it would be, was that these neutrophils became highly activated and long living, and they created, uh, if you like, um, a game of their own within the within the actual bronchus lumen, within the inside part of the tube that goes down to the gas exchange part of the lung, um, and they would actually clear the bacteria that were there. And w w very powerful, very powerful system. I'm unclear about... There's, there's lots of immunoglobulin type A's in the respiratory mucus. I'm still a bit unsure where that's actually being... These immunoglobulins are being produced, the IgA's in the respiratory mucus. Right. It's a good question. Um, IgA is coming from the pious patches too. It's just that it's not as powerful a system as the T cells. The IgA B lymphocytes also migrate from the pious patch and they have uh, special receptors on their surface, just as the TH17 cells, basically saying, look, I'm a postage stamp, take me to the bronchus mucosa. And there they appear, and then they make the IgA antibody, which contributes to protection. Uh, and it will block virus being taken up into cells. Uh, it will aggregate the bacteria to make them more palatable for the uh, the phagocyte. But what they will not do is activate the uh, various cascading systems yeah. that will provide the hand grenade that we talked about in systemic immunology. And so yeah. that became, in essence, the, the core part of mucosal immunology. But you might notice there's another slide here which told us that there was something else extremely powerful, extremely important, and has probably been the elephant in the room when we come to the COVID story because mm. it was never, ever properly factored into the equation. Mm. Yeah, just before we go on to that, I think, I think I've got this. So it's, it, the, the, it's the, 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 there are B cells that are sensitized to a particular antigen in the pears patch. They do migrate to the lymphoid associated tissue in the bronchus and they do produce immunoglobulin type A's. It's just that we get more immunity stimulated by the TH17 CD4 that then stimulate the neutrophil system. Yes. Oh, for example, if you put a bacteria that's going to kill, well, and this was done in rats, if you put mm. a bacteria like a what, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, which is the major bacteria that's very powerful in children with cystic fibrosis. If you put yeah. that in a rat, um, my colleagues who were helping me with these studies would take the rats home to do 12-hour studies because all the rats would be dead by the time uh, they came back to work the next morning. It was very powerful bacteria. However, if you um, fed them a lot of killed Pseudomonas, so they would go to the pa or we actually cheated sometimes and injected it directly into the pious patch. But if you pass these to the pious patch, the immunity was so strong that the rats were sitting up there asking for their breakfast the next morning. They didn't turn a hair. It, it was unbelievably powerful. Now, the, the, the interesting thing is that um, if we then looked at what cells from the pious patch was creating this high level of protection, we assumed it was going to be IgA antibody. But the B cells did a little bit, but not much. And we could show the antibodies that were appearing, uh, and but not much. But if we put the T cells in, then it completely prevented death in these, uh, these animals. It was, from a practical point of view, Robert, um, how, how, how much stronger an immune response is it to direct the Pseudomonas uh, 
attenuated dead antigen directly into the pear's patches as opposed to simply swallowing it? Um, because I, I would find it much easier just to swallow something and have it, have it injected into my pear's patches as a patient. My colleagues were serious PhD scientists and uh, they wanted to know exactly how much pa uh, antigen went into a pear's patch. What we did, we did both. And we showed that both were equally effective. Um, I'm, I'm reassured. Yeah. You're reassured. Yes, I was yeah. certainly. We, we weren't cheating. We were just uh, um, making, uh, uh, minimising the variables. I mean, I mean, th 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 this this First World War doctor just g basically getting Shigella, presumably yeah. just killing it in some way. Brewing That's it all up, he did. Yep. And and then giving giving the guys it to drink. I mean, it's just wonderfully simple. Yeah, and, and it, it and took, it worked. And it worked. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and so he must have saved thousands of lives from shagalosis, which is horrible. I'm sure that's true. Uh, I mean, all of this is documented. Um, it, it's interesting. I, I actually have a copy of his, his monograph. Uh, the problem is it's in French, and I'm not a particularly good reader of French. But I'll give you a hand there, with it when I come across, Robert. <laughs> but, I mean, it, it's interesting, isn't it, that, that someone as important as Bezreka, I, I doubt, is known to any of the modern-day immunologists, uh, and yet... He made these observations and he actually showed that there were agglutinins, antibodies that would clump the Shigella together. But he didn't, of course, know it was an IgA or an IgG. All of that came uh, 20, 30 years later. Yeah, I used to teach this, the students that the, the antibodies prepare the food for the phagocytes table. And, and, and that's it, you taught them well. Yeah, they, they clump it all in one nice bit. That's right. It, it's, so instead of having your smarties all around the room, you have them all in one. Yeah, you have more yeah. than one tube ready to pick them That's up. Exactly right. Exactly <laughs> yeah. right. Yeah. I mean, I mean it, it just seems the world is missing one heck of a trick. I've never had any oral vaccines apart from polio. Well, no, no, there's, there's the cholera vaccine. If you right, go I've never, to... I've never had that, but right, yeah, yeah. No, the cholera the vaccine is really, the standard cholera vaccine. Very effective. Yeah. Very effective. Yeah. Um, yeah. We may get on to, you know, the options of... of this is a completely new area of options and a potential for, for, for changing the way a mucosal surface reacts, you know, to a coronavirus, to a COVID virus, to a flu, uh, by optimising this process. Uh, it is, which, but it's which, also been sitting on the shelf since the First World War, so it seems like a bit of a... <laughs> well, no, there's a lot of shelves, it's just that they're, they're, they've got uh, locks on them. The, yeah. uh, I, I, we quickly have to move on to the, the elephant in the room. Yes, uh, I, I was lucky enough, I, I, after I finished my PhD, I, I went to uh, work with John Benenstock in, in Canada, which is how obviously I got involved in mucosal immunology. And I, I've always been interested in two things, uh, which were a bit different to John. Um, and that was, I was interested in humans and I was interested in T-cells uh, because my PhD had been in T-cells in, auto, in uh, autoimmune disease. And so um, I started extracting... Um, T cells from these mucosal surfaces in the gut, human gut, uh, and working also in in the rabbit. Now, I, I put up the uh, a slide from one of our very early publications. It's too long ago for me to even remember, let alone tell you. But it, it makes a very important point. Um, these were uh, rabbits that had been injected either into the lung, into the trachea, the airway going into the lung, uh, or into uh, the skin. Um, and uh, here, you, you, what you're looking at is the, uh, the uh, T cell response, T cells taken from either the washings inside the bronchus. So these are the T cells actually outside of the body, if you like, in the secretions, working away. Uh, or the T cells that were um, found uh, in the lining of the mucosa, which we call bronchus associated lymphoid tissue, BALT or T cells that we got from the spleen. So here, we, uh, there are, this is only a small part of a larger experiment. The point I want to make is that if you look at the T cell on, on the vertical axis, this is the uh, response when you're trying to stimulate the T cells. The T cells are responding to either make their cytokines or divide. So it doesn't really matter what index. So on the vertical index, we're looking at response, and on the horizontal index, we're looking at time. And they, one, two, and three are weeks. So at zero time, 
uh, the antigen, which was one we made, a unique antigen the rabbit had never seen, called DNPH, doesn't really matter what it is. Um, and you can see, looking at the T-cell responsiveness, at one week, obviously at zero time, there was none at all. It should have been connected. Uh, but one week, you can see that already you're getting response of T-cells in the bronchus lining, in the mucosa. Uh, no response yet in the cells in the bronchial washings. By two weeks, the spleen cells still hadn't really got their act together. Remember, the antigen had not been injected into the body. It had just been put down into the trachea, the breathing tube going into the lungs. By two weeks, we've got a really good uh, proliferative response. The cells are dividing quickly uh, when they're stimulated in a test tube after they've been taken out of the washings. And you've still got a fair amount of stimulation in the bronchus uh, um, lymphoid tissue. Uh, taken from the mucosa. But the important point is, at three weeks, there is no response at all. Now, this is crazy because if I would put up, uh, which we did, the study of the systemic immune response, by three weeks, there'd be a huge response uh, of T-cells. Whereas in the mucosa, it's not responding at all, but you can see the antigen from the bronchus has leaked into the body and the spleen cells are now starting to take off. And if we extended the study out, uh, the spleen cells would uh, actually continue to respond. But my point here is some, either the cells had become non-responsive or by themselves or something was turning them off. So this is the elephant in the room of mucosal immunology. And when I've talked to you in the past about downregulation or tolerance, this is what I'm talking about. It occurs in the gut, it occurs in the lung. And I, I wanted to put this up, not because I'm proud of what I did many, many years ago, because it's a, <laughs> it's a it's pretty a nice piece of, of science, Robert. Pardon? It is a nice well, piece of science. Well, it, 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 at the time, it was, people couldn't understand, we couldn't understand it. But uh, I then went back to uh, work at Prince Alfred Hospital, uh, the greatest hospital in, in, in Australia, wonderful hospital. Uh, I set up the clinical immunology unit there. And um, with um, I had some remarkable PhD students. And what we did is we said, well, look, are these non-reacting cells, is there something wrong with them? Or is there something turning them off? And we then did a, a very simple experiment where we took patients who were having uh, lungs resected for tuberculosis. And uh, we took lymphocytes from their bulk, from their bronchus, and we mixed it with their blood lymphocytes. And the blood lymphocytes, if we stimulated them with um, PPD, which is the antigen from tuberculosis, it was really very high. But if we mixed small numbers of cells from the lining of the, bron uh, the bronchus, it completely turned them off. So this was really the first demonstration of suppressor cells yeah. outside of the bloodstream. This was, these were tissue suppressor cells. Um, and... Um, uh, yeah, this is Tony Fauci and I. This is how Tony Fauci and I became friends a long, long time ago, uh, because we were both doing similar sorts of things um, a long time ago. Um, and um, so, so I, I'm not trying to promote very old science. I'm simply trying to say that that this is real, real life science where you've got a suppression. And other people like Pat Holt and, and others around the world really took this suppressor cell thing to uh, the next level and found that the lungs actually had a carpet of, remember we talked about dendritic or antigen presenting cells, and these cells capture all the antigens coming in and as well as the, the antigen going down to the pious patch, it activates these antigen presenting cells which go to the local lymph nodes and create what we call not T suppressor cells these days, but T reg cells, which do the same thing. So what we're looking at here, not knowing what they were at the time, is T reg or T regulation cells. Very powerful cells generated from within the lung environment and the bronchial lymph nodes. The lymph nodes, which are the lymphoid tissue, are immediately uh, uh, close to the, the bronchus and the lung. And presumably the function of these regulatory cells is to prevent inflammation in the airways, is it, Robert? Exactly. Exactly. Because look at what happens systemically. Systemically, you want a completely sterile bloodstream internal environment. 
and you're prepared to have a big inflammatory response to get that because free-floating bacteria and virus inside you is potentially a big danger and death. Whereas if you look at the lining cells of the lung and the gut, they're loaded with bacteria. We, we talk about the microbiota. In the gut, we say there are, so, there are more cells in the microbiota of the gut, this is bacterial cells, than there is in the rest of the body. We talk about it as the, the new organ system because it talks to the brain and talks to the rest of the body. Uh, I was just talking to a colleague today and he was talking about how maybe this bacterial population creates or gets rid of fat within the liver. I mean, all sorts of things now are being talked about uh, in diabetes, in fat metabolism uh, from these bacteria. But of course, you've got to control them. If they get out of hand, you're going to have infection and destruction uh, of the gut and the lung and, of course, invasion of the body. And so you have this very, very clever mucosal immune system, which is not sterilizing, not sterilizing, but controlling, keeps the microbiome down to acceptable levels. Microbiologically, then, there's a complete difference. So you've, we've got this massive eco-bacterial ecosystem in the gut, but the mucus lining the airways is pretty, pretty clean, isn't it? No, well, it's, no, it's got bacteria in it. This is, that, that's where the microbiome is. It's, right, it's so we do have a protected microbiome oh, yes. in, in the normal response. All the mucosal surfaces, even the eye, will have um, a microbiome, a particular collection of bacteria. Right, so, so if, if you do a culture and sensitivity on a sputum test, if you're looking for the right bacteria, it will always be positive. You'll find bacteria, always find bacteria, yes. But Just, very often it's contaminant from the microbiome of the upper airways because the sputum's got to come up from the lung, sure. go through the pharynx and then be swallowed. Yeah. So it'll, it'll catch um, the, the same, the ba a different set of bacteria yeah. which, which are lining the pharynx um, and the, the tonsils. And the tonsils yeah. work in a similar fashion to pose patches. Yeah. Um, they're doing for the upper airways what the pass patches are doing for the lower airways. Yeah, the, this ba the BALT, the, the, the bronchial-associated lymphatic Right, and I think tissue. that what we, what we must take from this is that when you get the mucosal immune system activated by bacteria or virus, it will stimulate through the pass patch not just a mucosal immune response, um, and at the same time, you've got the down-regulating, so we're, we're already talking about a balance. But it distributes, it ha makes some IgG cells which will go to the lymph node and the spleen. And so you, you get systemic, and this is why you get antibodies um, when you get, um, a, a, say, coronavirus, a COVID virus, which never gets into your lung, you still get circulating antibodies. And that's how you say, oh, you've had COVID, but it was very mild. Well, it hasn't been because the COVID has got into the systemic immune system. It hasn't. It's been aspirated down into the pass patch, and the pass patch delivers some IgG-producing B lymphocytes, which home, go by homing, to the lymph nodes, to the spleen. But also, you've got these suppressor cells going to the same sites. And so while the IgG antibody response to an injected vaccine for, say, measles gives you antibodies years later and high levels of antibody, uh, you don't get that when you get the IgG being distributed from mucosal aggregated lymphoid tissues like the pass patch and the tonsils and the pharyngeal lymphoid tissue. You don't because you have, then you get a balance which brings into play the elephant in the room, the suppressor cells that we've been talking about. And that's why people run into problems with multiple vaccination uh, in, uh, in COVID. So I, I kind of assumed that the systemic antibody response was caused by a level of uh, bacterial escape. No. But that's not necessarily the no. case. I mean, sure, uh, in, in a person with bad COVID that gets breathless, we know yeah. the bacteria has got into the gas exchange apparatus. Yes, of course. Uh, a lot yeah. of that will be uh, systemic stimulation. But at the same time, it's already uh, activated IgG systems by earlier being within, it, within the, the bronchus mucosa and, and going through the, that loop that we, we can see. You can see the loop um, uh, in that diagram that we, we had up. 
But this is an incredibly uh, good idea using... because it means that as soon as you get an infection into the upper respiratory tract, before it, most times it will go away, but the odd one that does become systemic because it gets down to the alveoli, by the time the bacteria or virus hit the bloodstream, then there's already going to be uh, antibodies there ready to combat it, specific antibodies for that particular antigen. That's brilliant. That, that's, that's correct. And of course, uh, nothing's new. Um, most of us have been getting similar types of virus infections yeah. all through our life, coronaviruses, flu viruses. And so there's a high level of priming. Um, uh, but, but of course, that priming also primes the down regulator and the up regulator. And we, yeah. we have to understand that this is all about uh, a balance. Yeah. Now, one thing I, I didn't go into, which I think is important, um, if you buy the fact that the activation of, if you like, the specific or the adaptive immune system that we've been talking about coming from the post patches, how do you get ongoing protection when you get such a short pulse of activity? Uh, and the answer is that um, the specific T cells that are going to the lining of the lung that you can see migrating there, they don't only just re they activate the, the, the neutrophils that are brought in to gobble up, the, um, uh, gobble up the bacteria, but they also change them. That means it's called a phenotypic change or a change in its nature. They become long-lived and they become very active at taking up and killing bacteria. And this phenotypic change is caused by cytokines produced from the T-cells and the epithelial cells that the T-cells act on to create a loop involving what's known as interleukin-1, which is one of the early discovered uh, cytokines uh, in the whole T-cell system. And this is called an autocrine loop. Now, you might remember that in an earlier session, we were, you gave a very good analogy of endocrine, where... Um, and we took the thyroid, where the thyroid stimulating hormone from the pituitary gland comes all the way through the body to go to the thyroid gland, and we call that an endocrine system. But we talked somewhere along the line of a paracrine system, yeah. where a cell sitting next to another cell, and I think we did this in relation to antigen-presenting cells yeah. and dendritic cells, it can make a cytokine or a hormone and act on the cell beside it, which might be a T cell. Uh, and that very close proximity is called, um, uh, so we had the autocrine, uh, and we, it's called a paracrine, yeah. because it's very Besides. close. Yeah. Here, we've got an autocrine system, where the cell's making its own stimulus, very clever. And, and we were able to show that in people who have got chronic bronchitis, or coughing up um, yellow sputum, um, and yellow sputum just means there's a lot of activated neutrophils. It's the neutrophils that make it look yellow. Right. Um, we took those neutrophils and found that if we exposed them to a an antibody against interleukin-1, it, uh, it stopped that autocrine loop and the neutrophils went back to being just like a blood lymphocyte, uh, blood uh, neutrophil, and didn't last very long and wasn't particularly active. Uh, and so there's this very clever system, uh, and this, this is just an example of how the innate immune system, remember that the neutrophil is part of the innate immune system, how it continues the protective mechanism after a pulse of T lymphocytes come from the pious patches. They're turned off, but they leave the ongoing innate system. And many years later, people picked up this idea in different systems, and called it learned innate immunity. The innate immunity has learned to become much more proactive. These neutrophils, Robert, the, the sensitized neutrophils, do we know if they're long lived? Or do these neutrophils divide and produce daughter cells that also have the same immunological memory? They, they probably act very much like what happens with lymphocytes in systemic immunity. Some become yeah. memory T cells, but what happens, they become residing within the lung. And recently there's been a lot of interest in pulling out um, B lymphocytes and T cells from the lung and say, oh, here we are, we've got resident T cells, resident B cells. Now these cells almost certainly have come from the payers patches. Um, they've done their job. They've, they've kicked the innate system into action. Uh, and they sit there in the lung. 
Um, a lot of this is still very much being sorted out. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and the actual role of the T and the B lymphocyte, once they've done their initial kicking along, uh, is still, to me at least, a, a little unclear. Um, it's very easy in an experimental system to pull some out and say, oh, look, it does this and this. But in the biological system where you've got interactive uh, up and down regulating cells, uh, it's a very different, different picture. So I think people will be interested, Robert, how this applies to the current uh, COVID vaccine. Um, I think what we have to call it an international debate now, really, that's going on about this. Yeah. Um, the, the limits or, or the problems with it. I mean, can, can we address the IgE issue first, the immunoglobulin type E issue with COVID vaccine? Yes. Well, um, if we, just before we did that, if we, if we just take COVID and see what happens when a COVID virus, if we put all this together in a yes. real life COVID situation, um, is that OK, John? Yeah, oh, please. Yeah. Very quickly. Um, the, the COVID virus comes into the airways and is taken up by the lymphoid tissue in the upper airways and some get swallowed down into the post patch. Right. And so you get B and T cells responding. But most importantly, remember the antigen presenting cell, the dendritic cell could create interferon and various other very antiviral molecules very quickly. So that, that very quick response from those cells uh, involving those receptor systems that we, we talked about um, that exist on the surface of the dendritic cell and inside the dend dendritic cell, um, they will translate, they, they get read into the DNA nucleus that makes, a DNA of the nucleus that makes these, um, and this is all innate immunity. And the excitement, of course, is that innate immunity now is moving from one side of the T cell to another, and we, we talked about that. But they also stimulate... Um, an IgA immune response, which, <clears throat> which has been measured, and also T cells, which have been measured, just as we've been discussing the way they should. Uh, and, and, and in most people, uh, that will contain the virus to within the bronchus. It doesn't get any further. Yeah. However, if, and this is what makes the coronavirus, corona 19, the virus of corona uh, um, virus 19, makes it a nasty virus is that it escapes, whereas the old coronaviruses rarely have ever escaped yeah. from the bronchus and gets into the gas exchange apparatus, yeah. where it then starts interacting with the uh, systemic immune response. And depending on the how much antibody and how much antigen, the virus being the antigen, the relationship between the two is whether you get immunity and no breathlessness or viral pneumonia, uh, or overactive uh, cytokine storm. That all depends on the, the expansive um, activation of the complement system, uh, the activation of various other enzymic systems that give this explosive hand grenade effect, plus the toxicity of the spike protein, which is the important protein on the surface of the virus that will bind to the cells to let the virus uh, get in. It's, it's the main way in which the virus gets into the cell to replicate. And so um, that's the difference between COVID-19 and its precursor cor uh, coronaviruses that have been around for probably thousands of years. So um, the main difference is that the SARS coronavirus 2 has got this ability to get down to the alveoli. Yes, it can escape it, out of the bronchus. Yeah, it, yeah, it gets, da it gets right down there into the alveoli. Right and, and down there. Once it's, once it's in the yeah. alveoli, they're, they're only such a thin me membrane. It's essentially in the exactly. systemic circulation. And the protection mechanism is no longer the IgA, uh, the mucosal system, it's the systemic immune system. So because the, the lung says with the gas exchange, no holds barred, we've got to really do everything we can to keep that going. If you don't get oxygen right. going in, carbon dioxide going out, you don't live very long. Got it. So the alveoli are part of the systemic immu immune system. Yeah. The other very interesting thing, just before we move off this, is that the spike protein um, will actually uh, bind to red cells as well as uh, uh, getting the virus into the, the epithelial cells that will allow it to replicate. And when it binds to the red cells, they agglutinate, they come together. And this was a relatively unique feature of COVID, uh, particularly in the early days when we had a very invasive uh, virus. Uh, and what was happening is that within a day or two, 
the oxygen tension was dropping uh, even before there was a lot of radiological change of pneumonia. And it's now been shown by a group in France with some help from some very clever Americans that um, uh, the, the, the actual virus can agglutinate the red cells. Um, and um, I probably shouldn't say it, but the one thing that prevents that agglutination is ivermectin, but that's a different story. Uh, that's, a, that's a scientific observation I'm talking about. Oh, yeah, we're allowed, um, to, we're allowed to talk about purely academic scientific well, findings this is, on this channel. This has been published uh, in peer-reviewed uh, quality journals. Uh, but it's, it's very interesting. So that's what happens. So what happens when you vaccinate someone? Uh, well, first of all, before I do that, I'll just make two more points. Yeah, please. Um, that when you, the virus is coming into the, the bronchus and the pharynx, pharynx and the nasal cavities, it's also stimulating suppressor cells, which are going to go out to the periphery as well as act on the uh, mucosa. And the other important thing is it's only the local immune response that's going to prevent spread of the virus to the person in the family or the person next door. Because IgG antibody, for all intents and purposes, does not get into the bronchus secretions. And this was something that should have been understood but never was. And it took them a long while to realise that by vaccinating someone with, which is going to stimulate IgG antibody, but essentially no or very little or useless IgA antibody in the secretions, um, then uh, the IgG antibody won't get into the secretions to prevent the virus multiplying and uh, being distributed uh, to infect other people. A very, very important point that I think underpinned a lot of the public uh, health issues. It is, and it's also a very, very annoying... It's a, ve it's a very annoying point as well because <clears throat> we had senior medical officers uh, standing up and telling us that telling children, for example, to become vaccinated to prevent their grandmothers to <laughs> getting infected. And yet, now let me ask you this question, Robert. How long have you known about this physiology that you've just described? Um, well, basically since uh, around about 19, early 1970s. I mean, this is not rocket science. This is stuff has been known. It, it was all in the literature. Um, but I, I think... In fairness, I think the people who were making decisions did not understand the biology of COVID infection. They did not understand mucosal immunology, uh, and they uh, certainly didn't uh, understand the, the importance of balance between up and down regulation that occurs. Uh, it's now obvious that, you know, it's become quite obvious. Uh, I, I wrote an article, I know, in, in January of 21. 21? Yeah, it was January or February 21. Yeah. And I said, look, you know, this doesn't make sense to me. You know, you, this is going to be like a flu vaccine. Uh, you're going to get a small transient response. It'll probably be good for serious disease. It'll stop. Uh, IgG antibody will uh, ameliorate the uh, um, serious uh, viral pneumonia that can occur, which, which I think it did in those early days. Um, but, you know, it's not going to affect what goes on in the bronchus. Uh, this is a local immune uh, determined uh, uh, event. So... Um, I'm sure other people were, were were saying the same thing. Yeah, but it's still I still find it bemusing that senior doctors didn't know this. I mean, they've all got mates who are respiratory physicians and immunologists, haven't they? You know. The... Yeah. Well, I, yeah. I, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I won't say anything. Yeah. They could have picked up the phone and talked to you. <laughs> I mean, you no, it was quite that. interesting when you look at the people who are on the uh, decision-making committees. Uh, and I talked to some of my, um, uh, there's some very, very good clinical immunologists in Australia, and I, I talked to a few of them at the time and saying, look, I asked them, I said, you know, are you on Atagi, you know, the committee? No, no, we don't know anyone on Atagi. Um, and uh, it, it was um, it, it was bizarre. Uh, they were infectious disease physicians, public health physicians. But in fairness, you know, um, I'm not a virologist. I, I, I'm not going to talk about the intricities of viral replication. I know a little bit about it, but not the not all the detail. Um, but um, just as the virologists really don't understand, or apparently not understand much of mucosal immunology. It would, it would appear so. So I think that just takes us on to the vaccine limitations now, Robert. Yeah. Um, starting off with the IgE? 
Yeah, sorry, I, I, you, did, you did ask about... Um, no, 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 that, 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 that was absolutely uh, part of the linear process, you're quite correct. OK. Uh, IgE is one of the immunoglobulins that occurs um, when against particular patterns of antigens, particular... Um, everyone who uh, is listening to this will know someone with hay fever or asthma or eczema, uh, and about 20-25% of people in the population make, have a propensity to make IgE against uh, antigens which are generally presented to a surface, either the skin or the mucosal surfaces. And that's why allergies, uh, lung allergies or gut allergies or skin allergies. This is atopy, Robert, isn't it? People, people at, atopy. atopy is the term used. It's got a long history in terms of what it means. But today it means a tendency to make IgE yeah. antibodies. Yeah. It's a genetic tendency. You know, yeah. if you have mothers and fathers that have got asthma, the chance of their children uh, having asthma and hay fever is much, much, yeah. much, much higher. Yeah. So you have a strong genetic factor. Now, the IgE is a very interesting uh, antibody. It was only really discovered by a, a Japanese um, husband and wife team, uh, uh, again, in, in the 60s, uh, late 60s. And, uh, issues are, and, and what they found was that the old skin... That they knew that there was a funny antibody that would bind to mast cells in the skin, which was called skin-sensitising antibody, but they didn't know what it was. And then um, uh, an IgE myeloma... A myeloma is a tumour of, of, of B cells, and occasionally they make IgE, and then you can get handfuls of this IgG, IgE, IgE. Uh, antibody, which normally is very low amount. In, in the blood. And this was found to be the so-called skin sensitizing antibody, which meant that it bound to cells called mast cells, M-A-S-T, mast cells, uh, which reside particularly in mucosal surfaces, the lung and the gut and, and also the skin. And if you then have an antigen, so, say um, you've got an IgE antibody against a COVID um, uh, antigen that you're going to inject in, in a vaccine, then or you have a messenger RNA making that antigen, then if you've got the IgE uh, antibody, then the antigen will bind to that and the mast cell will release all its contents, uh, mainly things like histamine and various th uh, leukotrienes. There's a whole range of these mediators that will act on blood vessels to dilate them and to make mucus secretion. Uh, and uh, if it occurs in the skin, you get a red itchy uh, lump, which is called urticaria. Uh, in the nose, you'll get swelling and get hay fever. In the lung, you get asthma. Uh, in the gut, you can get uh, food intolerance, various food allergies. Uh, you get a diarrhoea, maybe abdominal pain. Uh, so you get these sets of symptoms. If it occurs, if the IgE antibody is floating around in the blood and you inject the antigen, as you do with a, a vaccine, and, it will bind, and that antigen will bind to that IgE, you get massive release of these cytokines throughout the body. Not a localised effect in the skin, the lung or the gut, yeah. but a massive systemic release. And that's known as anaphylaxis. And that is life-threatening. You have to treat that with injected adrenaline straight yeah. away, which is why the doctor will say to you or the pharmacist, I want you to sit here for 15 minutes before yeah. you leave when I give you the injection because one in 10,000 people, not very common, but pretty important for that one person, yeah. one in 10,000 people injected with uh, a COVID vaccine will have IgE antibody in their blood. And they will get anaphylaxis, which if you treat it straight away with adrenaline, and that's why the doctor has you sitting there for 15 minutes, because he's got adrenaline sitting in a syringe just in case you're the one in 10,000. So this is pretty uncommon but very important to know about. Yep, and um, the, the next point there is, is, is autoantigen. What, what's the thinking with vaccination and potential autoantigen auto stimulation? Well, this is what is unique. This has not been seen before with any form of vaccine. This is only occurring in the context of... Uh, messenger RNA vaccines. Now, what yeah. we know about messenger RNA vaccines is they go to many cells in the body. They don't just go uh, to the regional lymph node where antibody is made, uh, but they spread and they make an un um, 
I mean, a, a completely unquantifiable amount of antigen. Yeah. If you inject a very small amount of flu vaccine, as we have at the moment, our flu season's coming and we're all getting our flu vaccines, you get a very small amount of measured microgram amounts of antigen. Yeah. However, when you inject a, a, basically a piece of genetic material that goes into cells and takes over the yeah. factories for protein in the cell and, and, and takes priority within those factories, it will make an unlimited amount. No one knows how much antigen is made on the surface of the cell or secreted into the bloodstream. We do know you can pick the antigen, which we know is the spike uh, protein because the spike protein is the uh, protect the antigen to which you're making an immune response to prevent the virus getting into the cell to infect you. Uh, we, 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 we don't know how much antibody is being made. Uh, and as we've discussed before, the amount of immune response is dependent on how much antigen. Too little or too much antigen has a net negative effect. And so if you have a completely um, unregulated amount of antigen production, it's going to make you more likely to have a negative or tolerant effect to repeated vaccines. And again, that's exactly what we find, that uh, on one hand, you've got the turning off of the immune response you want, and on the other hand, you've got turning on of an immune response against that spike protein sitting on the surface of the cell that's taken up the messenger RNA. So it's sitting there as a target. Now, this has been demonstrated in post-mortems. The Germans have led the way in doing this. Um, I, uh, there's been a, some very good small studies done, certainly in America, showing that the spike protein can actually be shown to be produced in the tissues of people dying following vaccination. Um, and you can see the T cells clustering around, uh, just as you would see in an autoimmune disease. Uh, this is only autoimmune. In, it's not autoimmune in one sense because it's the foreign antigen, but it's being seen in the same way and acted upon in the same way as you would see in an autoimmune disease. And this, to the best of my knowledge, is unique in uh, vaccinology. And it's probably a gets huge, something similar with the adenovirus vector vaccines, but yes. I yeah, it, yeah uh, that can do it too, but probably less so in the sense that you're... Um, you, you, the adenovirus, your antigen or the, the DNA that's going to code for it is part of the, the, the actual uh, attenuated virus that's going to be stopped. Yes. Um, it's not going to go on and on and on in the same way that it, yes. you, know, you can get messenger distributed everywhere. I mean, there's no doubt that it, potentially you can and, and probably you do to some extent. But um, if you look at all the people who are getting uh, myocarditis and uh, young people getting heart disease and uh, all the, the consequences of that, which we're only just starting to see uh, the tip of the iceberg of uh, yes. in terms of numbers and, and outcomes, uh, sudden deaths on sport fields, um, people dying from um, heart problems or brain problems in the first couple of days or first week after a vaccine. I mean, this is not occurring in, in, in lots of people, but it's occurring in some people. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I mean, when you put it in those terms, I, I just find this somewhat horrendous, you know, if you've, if you've got a pain, Robert, you can take 15 milligrams of codeine. Or you can take 150 milligrams of codeine. Or you can take 1,500 milligrams of codeine. As if, you know, but by the way, you can't. <laughs> no, please yeah. don't do that. No. <laughs> but, 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 you know, you, the, you, you, we, we, you're we're not controlling uh, the dose. You certainly wouldn't be liable to getting diarrhoea under those circumstances. No. <laughs> no. No, only take drugs that your own doctor prescribes, of course. Yeah. We use this purely as an example. But, you know, or, or, or if I gave you some morphine, I, you know, I'd, I'd be terrified to give you more than five milligrams unless it was very, very slowly. And, That's right. You know, but, yeah, you know, don't worry about it. Take 50, take 500. You know, yeah. the dose doesn't matter. It's just... But that's what's happening with these vaccines. We're not getting a controlled dose of antigen. No, it's a very, it's, it's a very good example of how we have built medical practice. Uh, yeah. We've built medical practice on careful observation, careful quantitation of uh, what goes in and what comes out. Yeah. And um, I, I think that while it's very sexy to think about uh, genetic vaccines like messenger RNA, um, it, it's uh, uh, it, it, no, no one, no one has ever shown they're better or cheaper or or quicker to develop 
than the good old-fashioned vaccines that we've had for 100 years that we know work. We know how they work. We know the level of them working. And we know their safety issues. So why on earth create something we know nothing about and, and give it to, what is it, something like 85% of the world's population? Unless you live in China, where they use the Sinovax. Yes, yes. And put it in those terms, it's just completely... Very smart. Yeah, it's just, yeah. Yeah. Now, my, my words have gone. It's just, <laughs> when you see the objectivity of it, it's just... Um... It, it makes no scientific sense. No. And, and we've talked about this before, but I think it's worth repeating, John, that to see billions of dollars billions of dollars being put into factories. Uh, off air, you, you were talking about making TB vaccines using messenger RNA. I mean, for goodness sake, sort out the positives and negatives now while we can. Get all the preclinical data, get all the clinical data, sort out the distribution, how much antigen is being produced. Can we do it better? Um, yes, we can. We must be able to. Uh, we'll I, I, would, I would have thought it's a good idea to do that work before we build the factory in Melbourne to produce 100 million doses <laughs> a year, B before we build the factory in Oxford to produce 250 million doses a, a year, before we build the factory in Canada, before we enlarge the factories in the United States. You're sounding awfully logical and awfully scientific, John. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, but you, we all know that these are all Or, or cynical, but it's not cynical. That we're, it's not I mean, it's the, the, very science, serious. The, the science makes sense. Yeah, I've got my grandchildren are going to be injected with messenger RNA around the corner for diphtheria, uh, pertussis, uh, flu. Uh, I'll be injected. I'm going to be asked to have a flu vaccine in a year or so, very soon, uh, which is made with, from messenger RNA. And, and everything that's gone wrong with the COVID one will go wrong with every other one because yeah. they're going to use exactly the same delivery systems. Yep. I think we should finally, met Robert, um, mention genetic, the potential for genetic incorporation with mRNA vaccines. We're What's not allowed to say there's yeah. genetic incorporation with the, uh, the current COVID vaccine. So if we just talk, talk about the theoretical possibility the, the of theory reverse transcriptase yeah. genetic incorporation with mRNA vaccines. Yeah, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, when uh, a couple of weeks ago we were talking about the, the preclinical, um, the, there was a comment on the preclinical data uh, that was submitted by Pfizer saying we don't have to do genetic studies because this is a vaccine study. Was, was it correct. something along those lines? Uh, Th that's the way I understand it. This was the leak yeah. report from, from the, uh, the TGA in Australia, wasn't it? Yeah, it was the information that went to every regulatory uh, body in the world. Which was um, only released as a result of uh, freedom of information requests. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, the thing about... Our messenger RNA is that the, the body does have an enzyme called reverse transcriptase. Now, the reverse transcriptase, I can remember back in the 80s and 90s when uh, HIV was dominant and um, um, the, the reverse transcriptase became uh, a big thing. And I actually got the feeling back then that the body didn't have any reverse transcriptase because uh, you might remember they were making antivirals, which were very effective uh, and uh, really changed the outcome of HIV. It's been terrific. Um, very different to what we, we see in, in COVID. Um, but uh, though, you know, it was really great breakthrough. You know, Nobel, Nobel Prizes were, were given. Um, the, but what, what, what has become clear is that the human cells do have some reverse transcriptase. And I'm certainly aware of three papers uh, that have described the reversal of genetic information. And again, uh, when I was a student, it was DNA to RNA to protein. Well, now we've got a situation where you can actually go from the RNA back to the DNA by using an enzyme that changes the single base difference between RNA and DNA. Uh, the uracil gets replaced out. And don't forget, um, with the uracil in uh, uh, the... Um, uh, in the vaccine, the messenger RNA vaccine, it's actually a suit. They've got a pseudo uracil, so you've got uh, an abnormal, um, uh, an abnormal amino acid. And what I don't, well, uh, sorry, base, uh, abnormal base, base. Sorry. yeah, uh, abnormal uh, uh, purine. 
pyrimidine, sorry. Oh, so, so, um, so the uracil in the vaccine is different to the uracil in our physiology? I, I'm, I am not certain whether they're, all the uracils in the vaccine have been replaced with pseudo-uracil, which is a methylated uracil. Uh, and again, I, I should know this, but I, 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 now you ask me, I'm not certain that I do. But th there may be a mixture, but we certainly know pseudo-uracil yeah. is there. Now, if you're getting reversal of the messenger RNA into DNA, so you've now got DNA coding for spike protein in the cell, um, I, you've got this potential added problem uh, and there may well be experts who know a lot more about this than I do who say, no, 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 for some reason the pseudouridine doesn't get translated, but my guess is it would be. But certainly there are at least three studies showing you do get this reversal of genetic information. Now, what does that do to the cell? Does that cell more likely to become a cancer cell? If it's a germline cell in the ovary or the uh, testis, uh, are those cells more likely to pass on to the next generation? Uh, abnormal information encoded, a spike protein is going to be produced uh, in a progeny, uh, in a, you know, your grandson, your great-grandson. We don't know these things. I don't know the answer. And I haven't, don't think anyone else, I know no one else knows the answers. These to me, John, are the questions that have to be asked and answered before we start giving this to 80% of the world's population. Maybe My thinking is the same as yours, Robert, but when the HIV thing first kicked off in the early 80s, I assumed that um, the reverse transcriptase was delivered purely by the virus itself. Yeah. Um, but I'm unclear where, 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 where the virus comes from in, for most of the reverse transcriptase in HIV, but as, as you correctly say... From the virus. Yes, yes. Yeah, I don't know if it comes from both or, or what, but... Yeah. but, but but there's certainly that. reverse transcriptase in human cells. I mean, this is now... Well shown. But yeah, well, I, think, I think we could say that that is known. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's true. Uh, mm. And um, there have been, um, as I said, a couple of studies I've seen where they've actually shown how the, the DNA has been changed to incorporate this new message-producing, uh, um, spike-protein-producing information. Well, yes. you know, how many cells does this happen to? Uh, does yes. it increase with time? Uh, do you get self-replication? Do you get this in the um, epigenetic, in the mitochondrial DNA? Uh, I don't know. Um, yeah. And, um, maybe and these, these questions should be asked before anything is anything further is done. I mean, I, 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 I tend to suspect that the risk of reverse transcription of of spike in somatic cells is probably relatively low because we must be getting reverse transcription of viral infections all the time. Yeah. And I agree, I agree with that. I agree with that. So um, presu presumably in old DNA like ours, if you look at our somatic cell DNA, that, that will bear the traces of uh, virus, viral infections that we've had throughout our lifetimes. It does indeed. Uh, I think it's... Uh, the the only right I, I think that's that's right and I I, I would I should have said that but I, I think the only rider is that we're, we're incorporating uh, a a different messenger RNA it's being yeah. translated where I'm not sure how the pseudo uridine for example the methylated uh, uracil whether that gets tr translated I mean thymidine uh, from memory's got a methyl group anyway um, correct me if I'm wrong I, uh, I can't remember <laughs> <laughs> going back a bit. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it, it may be that uh, uh, you don't get that transferred back. These are just questions that people like us should be told answers to. Yeah, I, I, I'm not. I mean, the, the, the question should be answered before we go on. But uh, it, it's, it's a risk which probably is there, hopefully won't be there or a big problem, yeah. but it, it certainly should be answered. But the, the, the one about the autoimmune stimulation and, and the uncontrolled antigen is the science there they're, is so they're, simplistic. They're, 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 they're big issues they're issues that occur and yeah. they really need to be sorted out i i agree with you um and when i've talked about this uh i i don't say too much about the reversal into dna because i like you i believe that uh, every virus around is going to have a little bit of it pop back into you know we've got a very complex nucleic acid yeah. structure in the nucleus haven't we fascinating yeah but, but well, certainly, but that's the, um, yeah, quite the enough for today, things. I think. Um, I'm, I'm quite, uh, <laughs> I always feel pleasantly tired after these talks. It's a, 
it's, 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 a, it's a nice feeling and I'm left with lots more questions but I think we'll leave that one there today I would just say to people do check on the whole series I'll put the links for the whole series uh, of, of these videos the specific era the cellular era the molecular era and now this cutting edge with the well, well vaccines that's only now coming to light even after uh, research going back to the first world war fascinating stuff well I think what John maybe we can just conclude by saying that uh, in a sense, uh, you and I decided we'd put on this series of four, um, showing that the, immuno the immune system can be understood uh, yeah. if you untangle untangle the complexities and the mouse genetics and all of that sort of thing. And we've actually gone through some fairly sophisticated ideas in immunology, hopefully in a way that people can understand. And we've packaged this... I mean, it came out of the COVID story and we were talking about so many things that people said, well, we think it's interesting, but we don't understand it. So we said, well, let's let's put together a, sh a short series of yeah. very simple understanding. And, and we decided to do it in an evolutionary sense, how it came over time so that we, we didn't confuse uh, the simple things um, with genetics that occurred uh, later. And we went through the antibody era, the cellular era, the molecular era, and today we finished with saying, well, wait a second, not everything is inside the body. Um, and particularly, uh, uh, we could finish with some comments on COVID because uh, it's so relevant to the mucosal immune response, which yeah. has been so neglected uh, in this whole saga. Oh, I'll just say one thing, that I'm hoping that people pick this up and can you, I'd, I'd be delighted to, uh, I'm trying this out with some uh, uh, medical students and doctors that uh, I, I deal with, and saying, look, have a look at the, these, these talks and then let's have a question and answer session for, say, an hour by Zoom or whatever. And uh, I'm certainly very happy to, uh, uh, to do that with people as, or groups of people uh, if they're really interested. That's great, Robert. Thank you. And we're also going to work out a way with my uh, techie to make these uh, files uh, downloadable as separate da downloadable uh, files. Excellent. So... Uh, they can be viewed uh, off offline. You can put them on your phone if you have a desire to do so. And, and many will. <laughs> Excellent. Professor Clancy, as always, been a pleasure and fascinating. Thank you very much. It's been a great pleasure. I've enjoyed it.